Okay, it's week five already, really, which means next week is almost the halfway point of the course. So see, I told you at the beginning of this, summer goes really fast, and it really does. So this week, I want to talk a little bit about coercion. Um, and, well, I say this a lot. I hope to make this lecture brief, and I really do, but let's see how successful I am. Let me get right into that. Okay, so here's what I want to talk about today in this brief lecture. I've given you some readings, and really you'll notice the readings really aren't as onerous as last week, for example. I do that on purpose. I, I, I try to make the readings a little bit uh, lighter on some weeks, and there's a reason behind that, and that reason is that I want you to consider the whole course as I talk about in the last two bullets. But let me talk about what I'm going to talk about, and that is um, the motivation behind course of mandates, the types of course of mandates, the responses to course of mandates, and the complicating variables regarding course of mandates. So the note here is actually administrative, and that is a couple things to think about. Um, not this week. This week we're going to have a discussion. But next week, the week after uh, week six, there will be the unit two journal. So you already did one journal. This will be the second of three, and you have some experience doing that. Uh, and so hopefully that one will also be successful and help you think through some issues. Uh, the second thing I want to remind you of is that you really ought to be thinking and researching your end of, of term essay. So remember in the syllabus, um, what I ask for is an essay. It's not really a full-blown term paper. However, what I do also say in the syllabus is that it has to be referenced. So I'm not looking for you just sitting down and writing a completely uh, unreferenced kind of essay. You, you do need to refer to some sources, but it is not a research paper. It is an essay in which you have an opportunity to comment and analyze using your opinion as well as uh, some of the literature to think about a, an intergovernmental management problem and the future of that problem. But already in the course, um, I think we've already covered enough to get, you know, to get your mind starting to be wrapped around this idea of some of the problems in intergovernmental management. And the last part of the course really helps you shape that a little more when we talk about specific areas. But right now, you ought to be thinking ahead on the issue you want to write an essay on. If you're having problems with that whole concept of an essay, please do contact me. And I'll, you know, I'll talk to you on the phone or by email or, you know, if the, if we could get together at the library sometime this summer, that's great too. But um, don't, don't let it go till, you know, it's due and then say that you just don't understand the assignment. I'd rather know now. All right, so what is the motivation behind these course of mandates? I mean, what motivates the federal government as such to mandate state and local governments to do things? Well, a, a mandate itself, the definition is that it's federally induced costs that cause state and local governments to take actions that they may not have taken on their own initiative given constraints on the local budget. So what am I talking about here? Well, there's costs involved, right? So I say there's federally induced costs, meaning um, it's not just a matter of the federal government saying something, do this, but it's the federal government saying, one, do this, and two, if you don't do it, there's going to be uh, something that'll happen. One is, um, we will withhold funds. That may happen. That's happened. Uh, highways are a great example of that. You know, I gave you an article, I think, uh, last week or the week before. Um, you know, the Highway Trust Fund has been used a lot to mandate certain federal policies, for example, having to do with, uh, you know, the intoxication rules for a DUI or the speed limits. And so the federal government has threatened in the past to withhold highway funding to states um, if they don't comply. But you know, a mandate might also just be the federal government saying, do this, and oh, by the way, we're not going to give you any money to do it. So there's some cost involved with the mandate. It's not just the federal government saying, hey, here's a good idea. Why don't you do it? And then it can be done for free. Um, because most things can't be done for free. 
so what motivates the 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 central government the federal government to to do these mandates well here's some of the things and i'm going to talk about these but one is this idea of the nationalizing of trends and so uh the nationalizing of policy trends political parties are centralizing um, and this means that there's a loss of power at state and local levels well that's significant because there was a time in the country when political parties weren't as top down and weren't as centralized the second thing is interest group growth and transformation so there are a lot of interest groups that may have started uh, regionally or locally uh, and interest groups themselves as a as you know a phenomena um, have gone from this idea really of business groups that was the humble beginning of interest groups which would focus on state and local issues like taxation to really we have an almost unlimited number of groups we really do in washington and in state capitals um, with agendas specific agendas that often cut across political boundaries including you know interest in regulation and so many of these groups um, have a national agenda and they're trying to push that national agenda in washington and they're trying to do it in lincoln you know an iowa city and every place else um, and then finally what i i'd like to point to is the nationalization of the media so um, we do know that there has been a demise in local newspapers and we also know that local television for example is you know if you look at it you, you see really a lot of emphasis on uh, short stories that typically aren't that controversial um, but we often see a, a news channel with three or four meteorologists um, you know they focus on bad weather um, or they focus on local sports and so it's not really necessarily real strong journalism and so what what do we default to we default to national media and, and so whether that's cable tv whether that's radio whether that's national print media those kinds of outlets focus on national trends which come to be local trends and so the question is there's this old quote by tip o'neill that all politics are local i mean 30 40 years later hence from when tip o'neill said that i often wonder is are all politics national and we're actually translating them into local areas i think that's just a rhetorical question okay so what are some of the types of coercive mandates so there's these four that you see in the readings that i've given you one is a statutory direct order mandate and that is an example of that is the real id act right that was this driver's license act that passed in the bush administration and theoretically if you go back to what the bush administration was trying to do it was actually in keeping with president bush's emphasis on post 9 11 security it's it's really tied up in that and so the idea was that if everybody in the united states who has a driver's license has this compliant kind of license driver's license that can be used as a secure id that would be a great thing and that would be an anti and counter-terrorism kind of device right so it's not quite a national passport it's not an internal passport but what it is is it's an id that can be relied upon no matter what state you live in that was the idea well there's a lot of rejection of that by state levels and so that's what that article is about that i include and then there's examples like the sewer separation project in omaha well omaha and other places um, where storm sewers and sanitary sewers have to be separated from each other I mean it's a better idea but they weren't built that way initially and so basically omaha has this mandate to separate all the sewers basically east of 72nd street but omaha is not getting any money to do it and then there's grant conditions that's another type of course of mandate so uh, recall that the original uh, affordable care act required states to expand medicaid or risk losing their federal share so this part was invalidated by the supreme court decision in 2012 but but in that original law what it said was every state has to expand medicaid expanded medicaid simply means that medicaid would be awarded to persons who were earning uh, 133 percent of the federal poverty level some states have voted individually to expand medicaid but the initial um, 
ACA law really was more coercive. It said states must expand Medicaid. Now, in, as it turns out, in the original ACA law, because of Senator Ben Nelson, the federal government agreed to pay for expansion, that, that is the state share of expansion, for several years. But still, there are a lot of states that didn't do it. A third kind of uh, course of mandate is total statutory preemption. So what does that mean? That means that the federal government, Congress really, is taking away uh, the prerogative from a state to, to have a policy in a certain area. So the Voting Rights Act itself was actually a statutory preemption. So what it did was the Voting Rights Act made illegal several state laws restricting um, voting. So it, it outlawed voter literacy tests, property requirements, poll taxes, things like that. And then finally, there's a partial statutory preemption. So um, for example, well, let's talk about marijuana law because it's an interesting topic in federalism. Um, the Obama administration um, had said that it would be largely hands off as long as the states, uh, and they gave an opinion, said, as long as the states implemented strong and effective regulatory and enforcement systems to control the cultivation, distribution, sale, and possession of marijuana consistent with the traditional allocation of federal state efforts in this area. So the Obama administration wasn't quite saying we're not going to enforce federal marijuana law. What they were really saying was, okay, it's, it's all right with us if some states say marijuana is legal, but here's the stipulation on that. So that was a, a partial preemption. Now, um, at least initially, and, and there really hasn't been a lot of talk of this lately, but initially under um, the first uh, President Trump Attorney General Jeff Sessions, uh, what he said was that the federal government would strenuously enforce federal laws regarding marijuana. Well, what we've seen actually is more and more states um, actually passing both me uh, medicinal use and recreational use of marijuana laws such that what seems to be happening is we have a, a popular movement by the states to effectively legalize marijuana. So the question will become whether the federal government and Congress will simply say, we surrender, you know, we are not going to have uh, a federal law regarding marijuana. That's just going to be an interesting one to watch, I think. Um, and then there are... Um, federal income tax provisions affecting state and local tax bases. So, for example, the the tax reform, the Tax and Job Cuts, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. What that really did was it, um, among other things, was it forced some states to rewrite their own tax code. Um, and I have a little link there. But the reason for that is because many states base their income tax on the federal standard. So in Nebraska, for example, a new personal exemption had to be added, uh, essentially so that people wouldn't pay more in Nebraska um, income tax. So that was a form of a mandate, um, but it was, you know, solved in effect by state law. And then there's regulatory actions by federal agencies or courts. So we go all the way back, you know, 60 years to um, Brown versus the Board of Education. Um, so basically, the Supreme Court said that uh, integration of public schools was mandatory. And so that brought about uh, integration programs at city and local school districts. And that was really the result of a, a court ruling. And then there are regulatory delays and non-enforcement. So we are continuing to argue about DACA. In fact, uh, just passed a DREAM Act in the House of Representatives. Um, you know, it remains to be seen if it will pass the Senate. But the point of DACA is this, that under the Obama administration, DACA really wasn't, it was an exec, it was a set of executive orders, but it wasn't a law. And so President Obama was criticized strenuously by members of Congress for that, for usurping the congressional prerogative. And in fact, all executive orders, in a sense, are probably going to usurp some congressional prerogative, if you think about it. Um, but what DACA really said, what, what the Obama administration was really doing was ordering agencies in the federal government 
to selectively enforce the law. I mean, it was saying your priority is not going to be these young people who were brought to the United States at a very young age. Your priority is going to be other classes of persons who are in the United States illegally. Uh, for example, people who have committed felonies. And so the Trump administration has said that it would, you know, it would overturn DACA and it has done some things to do that and basically changed the registration uh, requirements so that new persons couldn't um, apply for DACA. But again, it, the Trump administration also was doing that through executive order. Now, what's interesting to me is, is as far apart as the Obama and the Trump administrations seem, um, you know, to people on the outside looking in, the fact of the matter is both President Obama and President Trump said, you know, Congress needs to pass immigration law. And that's really true. Um, you know, the the law has been modified by executive orders, but um, the law is still the law. Um, and then there's federal exposure of state and local governments to liability lawsuits. So, for example, Congress um, allowing potential lawsuits against state and local governments to motivate compliance, such as cleanup of environmental sites. All right, so um, states can be find themselves with some exposure um, to the federal government. I, th I think the opposite is true, really. Um, the Keystone XL pipeline is a great example. Both the Obama administration and the Trump administration, they had different views on that pipeline, tried to use the federal muscle to either stop the pipeline from being built or to make the pipeline get built. Curiously enough, interestingly enough, the the holdup has been the state of Nebraska. Um, and the Public Service Commission, which has uh, authority over whether or not the pipeline will be built. And so is allowing a private company, TransCanada, to build a pipeline across the United States, is that coercion or, or is it not? That's an interesting question. So what are some of the responses to coercive mandates, that is by the states and local governments? Um, well, as you see in that Reagan and Deering article where they talk about real ID, here's some of the responses. One is just passing laws to state that the state itself has is refusing to comply, as with the Real ID Act. That was done by some states. The second is simply just passing resolutions, for example, in a state legislature uh, or by a governor that implores Congress to repeal the law itself. You know, basically a nicely worded resolution that says, we think this law is a bad idea. We'd really, really like if Congress would repeal it. Um, you could oppose portions uh, violating existing civil rights and privacy protections. Uh, you could demand full funding by Congress. And all these things were done by states, as in the article. And then there's others in the table in the article, things like um, you know, just having a philosophical basis, and again, probably by resolution, that the national government has overstepped its bounds. Um, a there is the practical basis, which states, you know, basically protest the law by saying, you know, you're making us do something that we don't have the infrastructure to do. You're making us change our driver's license system, and that's going to cost us a whole lot of money. Um, now. The fact of the matter is Real ID is still in force, and I gave you a link to the website that shows uh, its current status, but that law has been continually pushed into the future, um, but the Department of Homeland Security has continued to track it, and you can see on that link what the status of that Real ID law is right now. So it's an interesting case in coercion. So uh, I gave you this other reading from Gormley, and this is a really a theoretical article that talks about some of the responses to coercive mandates where Gormley hypothesizes what are some of the um, hypothetical relationships. And he has this chart in there. And so you see it's this three by three chart. So on the left-hand axis, you see the federal unfunded mandate going from low, medium to high, right? And then you have federal financial support going from low, medium, and high. So what Gormley hypothesizes, which makes kind of common sense is that if there is uh, there is low unfunded mandate, that is um, there's 
there's a mandate that doesn't cost much, but there's high uh, financial support. Actually, let me start over. I, I kind of said that wrong. If if the mandate itself is not too onerous, but there's high financial support, um, the hypothetical relationship is going to be one of low conflict, right? So states really, in a sense, uh, have a problem with Medicaid, but for the most part, Medicaid is still operating as designed because the federal government does pay a large chunk of it. Um, but what if there's a high, a medium, and there's medium financial support? So Gormley says there's medium conflict, you know, whatever that means. But then if there's a lot of requirements with the mandate and there's low financial support, there is high conflict. So you can fill in all these other squares in this nine square block and kind of figure out what the relationship might be. I The question is, you know, does this really, does this really carry out in practice? And, and one of the things to think about is the Affordable Care Act Medicare mandate. So here's what Gormley's findings were. Um, First of all, the study is pretty limited and because it has low numbers of observations. But what Gromley finds is where federal mandates are numerous, that's like environmental policy, federal agencies often attempt to placate states with some rhetoric. States might file lawsuits. Um, there might be absence of waivers in environmental policy, but they might lead to um, innovations like performance partnerships. In education policy, there's fewer mandates. Um, even though we talk about the mandates a lot, there are actually fewer. Um, there's often the request for waivers. So this happened, we know, with the No, uh, no Child Left Behind and the follow-on um, Every Child Succeeds Act by the Obama administration. Um, there have been multiple waivers to that law that the states have tried to use to reduce the coercion. In Medicaid policy, exceptions and waivers are also important. Um, and like I said, this is kind of what made the ACA surprising to me in this context, and that is that the federal government offered to pay for Medicaid expansion for several years, but still many states refused that and also challenged the law in court. And so now we're, we are at the point of saying, okay, so what's going to happen to the ACA uh, ultimately? And uh, I wish I knew the answer to that. I don't know the answer to that, but it'll be interesting It'll be interesting to see, but but the ACA proved to be such a divisive law in a sense um, because it appears that the split was really along partisan lines. And so the question is, um, you know, what's going to happen to the law? But the other question is really um, what happens with health care policy in the United States? And I think that's that's really an interesting question, too. So what are some of these intervening variables that you know, I'm talking about. Um, well, there's the nationalization of the policy agenda, right? So um, we can't talk about education, health care, welfare reform, homeland security, marriage laws without really making that applicable to the entire nation, can we? I mean, this is what has happened with these kinds of issues, right? There's there's very little uh, there, there are state welfare laws, right? There are local laws that that um, touch on welfare. However, what we typically talk about are our national welfare reform, right? We talk about national education policy. We talk about national health care policy. So the issue is that we have nationalized these and other policies that weren't nationalized, you know, previously. And so that affects local policy. We see the growth of the centralization of the two-party system. So some of you might be involved in uh, party politics, which is great, but I think you could probably attest to this, that each party, each party has tried to enforce party discipline from on high, and they're trying to do that more now. So for many decades, the Democratic Party had this group of very powerful Southern, they call themselves the Dixiecrats, uh, who were very powerful in in the Congress for decades, and that fell apart. Um, at one time, there were uh, Northeastern Republicans who really were more liberal than uh, Midwestern colleagues, even in the Democratic Party. 
Um, and then there are states like Nebraska that had conservative Democrats like Exxon and Nelson. But the question is, is that happening now? There's some really interesting research that you can look up on Pew Research that talks to um, how the median Republican and the median Democrat um, have a much wider gap between them now from you know, the 1980s on. I can tell you personally from my own research into um, military budget issues that in the 1980s, um, it wasn't a lock for Pres President Reagan wanted to increase um, defense spending, but some of the people who opposed him in Congress happened to be strong Republicans, actually. And a couple of the people that went along with him happened to be Democrats. So the 1980s was, was really interesting. The question is, we have, we have evolved, but why have we evolved? And then there's the growth of interest groups with national agendas, right? So we kind of talked about this before, but a couple of examples of interest groups with a national agenda are groups like the NRA and the Sierra Club, right? They have national agendas, but they also work to import their views to state legislature. And then there's the simultaneously, simultaneous and rapid changes in the press, right? So the press in the First Amendment was basically just anybody with the printing press who wanted to print anything they want. Um, well, now we have a national media, both commercial and public. We have a demise of the newspaper industry, and we have exponential growth of social media with the attendant suspicion of veracity, right? So is all the stuff you see on Facebook true? Is all the stuff you see on Twitter true? And how would you know if it isn't? So there's all these kinds of issues that go along with the nationalizing of policy issues. So all this leads to this group discussion and I call it a group discussion and I somehow messed up canvas. So I'm just actually gonna put both questions on the same discussion and I just want you to answer one. So basically you can read those there but I want to talk about coercion. I want to talk about the detriments of coercion and the benefits of coercion. And what I'd like you to do is choose just one of these questions and write to that. So you're either going to write about detriments of coercion or benefits of coercion. And then feel free to respond to just anyone on the discussion, but only pick one of those questions to write to. So that's all I have for this week. Please do the readings. Please be thinking about your essay and please do contact me if the essay is just giving you a headache. I will happily talk to you. Thanks.